much, John, for coming on our show today and My sharing pleasure. your expertise and, and background in business. My pleasure. Um, to begin, can you tell us about your um, expertise and also the Institute of WOW, the work that you do? Sure. Well, uh, look, uh, I own a business now which is a marketing advisory service called the Institute of WOW, as you said. Um, but my career started back, uh, of course, when I was in my 20s and uh, I was in the retail business. And um, I was promotions manager for a shopping centre here in Sydney called Roselands Shopping Centre, like a big Westfield. Mm -hmm. And uh, then moved on to work for Woolworths and uh, went into the head office and gained a national marketing role with Woolworths. And, um, they were a good trainer. If you're looking for someone to train you about uh, the disciplines of marketing and advertising and salesmanship, then a retailer is generally a good trainer. And then after I'd finished um, a number of years at Woolworths, I decided to set up my own business. And uh, I set up a business called Dynamic Ideas, mm -hmm. which again, of course, like the Institute of WOW, was all about providing businesses with ideas. And enjoyed that very much. And uh, throughout that time, I ended up developing um, Aside from a lot of sales promotional campaigns for the fast food chains like McDonald's and Kentucky Fried and things like that, I ended up uh, doing a lot of the big promotions for the newspapers, for News Limited and Fairfax. Um, things that perhaps people my age would remember, and that is the scratch bingos in the newspapers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of those things to stimulate circulation. And I went on to end up, I ended up taking out the license for the rugby league bubblegum cards. And again, it's not a girl's product, so I wouldn't expect <laughs> that you would know much about it. But as teenage boys growing up, part of the whole ritual is that you collect basketball cards mm -hmm. or football cards. And so I ended up taking out the license for that. Oh, fantastic. Mm. And uh, can you tell us about the Institute of WOW and the work that you do with, with um, I guess, trying to inspire entrepreneurs and business owners with the, uh, the WOW factor? Look, I, I've created my business and call it the Institute of WOW um, because I believe that uh, if you're in business, you need to have a WOW factor or more than one WOW factor. And when I say wow factor, um, I guess if any of your viewers have read The Purple Cow by Seth Godin, then they would know that uh, that's his mantra as well. He says that you need to be the purple cow to stand out in the field with all the other cows. I say that you need to have a wow factor to stand out to all of the other businesses. And uh, I, also, um, I also tell business owners that they need to be the un of their industry. So therefore, unlike anyone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I said to you, for example, the airline industry, um, pretty much most of the airlines look the same. They just sound the same with their marketing, they look the same, they've got the same aeroplanes, mm -hmm. the hostesses are dressed in much the same sort of uniform. But if I said to you, look, there is one airline that stands out because of its, its owner, um, that owner goes out of his way to make sure that if you're thinking about an airline, you're going to think of him. And uh, I'll ask you the question, who do you think that might be? I would say Richard Branson. Richard Branson, okay. Mm -hmm. And I bet you if I asked you about any other airline, you could probably not put any name next to another mm -hmm. airline. Yeah. And that's how clever he is. Obviously, he's gone way past airlines these days, but his brand Virgin, of course, is out there with a whole host of things. Mm -hmm. But he has spent his life on becoming the un of his industry. He's unlike anyone else. And uh, what would you say is, is your wow factor? What makes the Institute of Wow um, unique? Good question. Um, if you looked at who my competitors are, they would be advertising agencies, okay? And uh, advertising agencies, uh, you know, they promote themselves as being pretty savvy marketers, and a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do is go out of my way to promote myself as being very different from an ad agency. And the reason that I am very different from an ad agency is that uh, most advertising agencies will give you um, the advice that goes something like this. Let's have a good jingle. Uh, let's have some good looking models. Um, let's buy some TV and radio and press advertising and we will build your brand. We'll build your brand and when we do that, eventually people will come. Mm -hmm. Well, we live in a world these days that's uh, built on shareholders uh, jumping up and down at the annual general meeting going, we know you're building our brand but we would like to sell something <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. And if it's a smaller business, it's mum and dad around the kitchen table saying, uh, uh, we would like to sell something as well as build a brand. So I say to business owners, look, the big difference with me is that I will help you sell stuff tomorrow mm -hmm. and build the brand simultaneously because they shouldn't be mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. And client after client of mine um, get the benefit of actually getting wow factor marketing ideas that make a difference tomorrow in their cash registers, but at the same time we're building the brand. They should not be mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Oh, the other thing that's a bit different from me is that generally speaking with an advertising agency, you will get the, uh, the more mature person like me that will go in and score the account. Mm -hmm. So they will impress the 
owner of the business that, you know, they've been doing this for 25 or 30 years and they, uh, they will then get the account and then the next week you'll get the 23 year old um, assistant that will service the account. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that, don't get me wrong, it's just that if your business needs heart surgery, um, well let's, let's say this, if, if you were getting heart surgery, let me ask you this question, this is terrible, I'm interviewing you now. Um, <laughs> if I asked you this question yeah. and, and I said, you, you're, you're gonna have heart surgery, mm -hmm. and two doctors walked into the room, mm -hmm. and one doctor was my age, and the other doctor was 23, who had just come out of medical school, who do you think you'd want to do the operation? Mm, the older person. The more sick, yeah. Of course. And so that's the big difference that I provide to people. I say to them, listen, this is not having a shot at Gen Y's at all, yeah. far from it. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, if your business needs heart surgery, mm. I think you might like to have someone that's been doing it 20 or 30 years and made yes. all those mistakes compared yeah. to someone who just came out of uni. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And that's what happens with a lot of ad agencies. The point is, mm. with an ad agency, a lot of the servicing of the accounts is, it, is done by people who've just come out of uni. Sure, sure. And uh, what are some examples of wow factors, whether it be products or services? Um, I know that you've written several books yourself. I have indeed, and uh, I'll show you one of my books in a moment, and I guess it in itself is a bit of a wow factor. Um, let me go, well, okay, the best example I can give you of wow factor marketing, and that is marketing that takes the eyes off the price. That's sure. what wow factor marketing is all about, yep. because you should not, no, it doesn't matter what business you're in, you should not market on price. Mm -hmm. And the reason you shouldn't is because it's not sustainable. Yeah. You can have a 50% discount this week perhaps, but you can't do it every week, otherwise you'd go broke. And even the big retailers here in Australia, David Jones and Meyer, they've woken up to that. They only have two sales a year. Mm -hmm. So a good example of wow factor taking eyes off the price would be McDonald's. Um, they've been very clever for 25 or 30 years uh, with a Happy Meal box, okay? And in the Happy Meal box is a free toy. And uh, you're talking to someone who's the father of six children and they're aged 15 through to 26 now, so they're too old for Happy Meals now. But at one stage, my wife and myself had six children in the back of the Trago, and if we came anywhere near those golden arches, you can imagine what was happening. <laughs> we would buy six Happy Meal toys. I think over the period of time when we had six under 12, uh, we spent $5 billion <laughs> on Happy Meals. And you know what? I can't tell you what they cost. Yeah. The thing is, that because the toy took everyone's eyes off the price. Mm. We just got the box and gave it to them. They threw the hamburger out to play with a Disney toy, of course. Mm. Um, another good example would be Harvey Norman here in Australia. Um, they do things like two years, two years interest free. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, guess what that does? It takes your eye off the price. I had a turf farm, somebody that markets grass. Mm. And they said to me, look, um, we're in a very price competitive industry because the landscapers who generally buy the turf off them to put in a new home, mm -hmm would say, look, we can get it for $4.50 a square metre down the road, you're charging $5 a square metre. So we brought in a campaign that if the landscapers bought grass off this turf farm, for every home's worth of grass they bought, they got a carton of Crown Marga. Now, if you talk to any mm -hmm. landscaper who's drinking 2Es or 4X and you say you can get a carton of Crown Marga, yeah. <laughs> they'll love you for life. It catapulted sales for his business because you think about it, if you were a landscaper and you've got two um, turf farms to buy from, that guy will give you a carton of Crown Lager for every home's worth of turf. The other guy just gives you the turf. Where would you get your grass from? Yeah, well, the one with the, the free price, yeah. Exactly, so the thing is, and, and can I just say, uh, they're not even free prizes, they're actually mm. free giveaways. So therefore, yes. when people, I used to run a lot of contests, scratch games and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And when people ask me, would I do that now? I'd say no. I said the best thing to do if you want to actually create a real wow factor is present um, a proposition to the customers, mm -hmm. which is you buy, you get. Okay, so you buy a home's worth of grass off us, Mr. Landscaper, we'll give you a carton of Crown Lager. Mm -hmm. And what this landscape guy said to me who owned the business, he said, you know what, within two weeks, we had the landscaper who was the biggest pain of all, who used to always want price discounts, come to us and buy 22 homes worth of grass, which mm -hmm. meant that he got 22 cartons of beer. Yeah. And he said he never even asked the price. And he was the biggest pain in the backside asking price. Yes. He said he just rang up and said, I want 22 homes worth of grass. And he said, I need the uh, beer by Friday. I'm not too fast when I get the grass. Mm. <laughs> That's what happened. That's how powerful it is. That's how yeah, powerful exactly. it is, yeah. And I uh, wanted to ask you about um, the, the power of the freemium business model as well. So. Um, can you tell us about freemium and how um, entrepreneurs can use that to um, grow their business? I think the best version of that is online. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the reason is, is that the freemium item is free. Its cost of goods is, is either very low or free. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that most websites, not just in Australia, but certainly right around the world, for small to medium-sized businesses are woeful, awful, disgusting. Yeah. I'm trying to think if I can come up with another nasty name. <laughs> um, they're just bad. And the reason is, is that because they let anyone come onto their website and never collect any data. They don't know who came. And if they've got a high bounce rate, which means, of course, they're coming onto the home page but going nowhere else, then, of course, um, it's even worse. Um, the freemium that I believe works is that when you have visitors come onto your website, you invite them to download a free uh, report or a free video or free something. And, of course, in order to download that, guess what they've got to give you? Their contact details. Mm -hmm. And wait till I tell you this. The other thing is, is that... Um, um, I have clients uh, right across the board in all sorts of industries and until they became my client didn't have any video on their website mm -hmm. and the fastest growing communication tool online of course is video just yeah. ask your, you know, YouTube mm -hmm. and yet there are most businesses out there not taking advantage of that mm -hmm. now the great thing with video is that it's been proven it can be 10 times more persuasive as a marketing tool um, then a, sorry, the, the, the best thing about video testimonials, and that is people telling everyone else how good you are, mm -hmm. is that they've been proven to be 10 times more powerful than a written testimonial. So I say to all of my clients, if a video testimonial is 10 times more powerful than a written testimonial, get rid of all the written testimonials on your website because they think that you've just written them and put someone's yeah. name on the bottom of them, <laughs> and get more video testimonials up. But that leads me to the freemium thing once again. If video is so powerful, then make a component of your free offer, that is a free report, also a free video download. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say you were doing uh, interviews like this, and you came across someone who was really skilled and interesting, uh, unlike me, um, who was seen to be great value. Can you imagine if you on your website said, you know what, we're gonna have a weekly freemium download mm -hmm. of this guy telling you exactly what you need to do with your signage, with, you know, that'd be one week, the next week will be um, um, uh, online sales, mm -hmm. the next week will be website design, the next week will be customer service and so on and so forth. Can you imagine if someone had something like that on their website, now I'm just yeah. talking about my industry at the moment, but it mm -hmm. could be any cake decorating, it could be anything. Yeah. If you had a, a brilliant cake decorator that you were able to get a whole lot of videos out of, can you imagine who would not want to download that? Everyone would want to download it and guess what? They give you their details. In terms of um, good business ideas and where entrepreneurs and uh, startups can go and look for um, good ideas, do you have any tips for trying to um, navigate that and look for you know, real, real problems as such? Um, aside from saying, yes, you know, the institute of wow.com. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but all jokes aside, the thing is, is that um, um, my children who are Gen Ys <clears throat> don't ask me for advice very much. Funny about that, isn't it? That you never ask your parents for advice. And as they get into their 20s, the advice I give them is hang around um, entrepreneurial thinkers. Yeah. Because generally speaking, you are who you hang around with. Yes. You know? um, and so therefore, my advice to anyone, doesn't matter what age they are, mm -hmm. who is thinking about starting up a business and becoming an entrepreneur, will hang around the right people. Um, don't go to all um, events or seminars because you need to cherry pick the ones that you have researched are going to provide you with value. But there's no question that seminars and events like that are very, very good forums for you to meet the right people. Mm -hmm. And if I, I know this sounds self-serving, but if I was going into business tomorrow, it doesn't matter whether it was a cake shop, whether it was a landscaping business, whether it was builder or baker or candlestick maker, mm -hmm. I would advise any business owner to hang around marketing people. And the reason is, is that when I'm doing my own seminars and I have 100 or 200 business people in the room, I say to everybody, look, do you think that sales and marketing skills are the most important skills that you need in business? Everybody puts their hand up. Mm -hmm. They all go, yeah, yeah, because it all starts with a sale. If you don't know how yeah. to sell, well, you've got no business. And I say, okay, well, that's good. Let me ask you another question. Who here has an accountant? They all put their hand up, mm -hmm. all 200. Okay, who has a solicitor? All 200 put their hand up. And then I say, well, given that you've acknowledged that above those two areas, accountancy and, and law, that the most important thing in your business is learning sales and marketing, who has a sales and marketing advisor? Mm. 
nobody puts their hand up. Yeah. And that's the crazy, crazy thing about people going into business. They go into business and they have people looking out the back window, which is generally your accountant and your solicitor. There's not too many of them that tell you what to do going forward. <laughs> They're just yeah. telling you everything you did wrong last year. Um, they have no one advising them on what to do going forward. And they have no one advising them on any marketing or advertising, which means is that I don't know what they think. They must think they're just going to open their doors or open up their website and all these people are going to come rushing in. It doesn't work yeah. that way. So my advice is hang around entrepreneurial thinkers who are generally speaking marketing and advertising and entertainment. You've alluded to um, a couple of mistakes that entrepreneurs um, make. Uh, what would you say are the top three that you um, noticed in, in terms of your own practice and experience of working with a lot of um, business owners? Top three, top three. Okie dokie. Uh, number one, um, they market on price. Mm -hmm. Cardinal sin. Do not market on price. Uh, market on value add and market on your expertise. Number two, they do not position themselves as an expert. Mm -hmm. um, we all gravitate to experts. Um, you would not have me here on your TV show if I hadn't proven to you that I was an expert at what I did. And so therefore, if you look at Steve Irwin, um, he was not the only crocodile wildlife expert in the world, but mm -hmm. because he marketed himself as an expert, we all gravitated to him. Uh, Don Burke, um, the gardening guy, he promotes himself as an expert, we gravitate to him. Uh, Gordon Ramsay, the chef, we gravitate yes. to him. The master chefs, do you think the master chefs on TV are any better than a lot of other chefs around the world? No. Yeah. And if you ask them, they'd probably say the same thing, but yeah. because they're marketing themselves as the expert, mm -hmm. people gravitate to them. Now, I'm not saying to any business owner who is watching this to promote themselves as an expert if they're not, mm -hmm. because you wouldn't want your heart surgeon to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are good at what you do, and generally if you go into business, you are, then promote yourself as the expert, because mm -hmm. people will gravitate to experts, and guess what? They'll pay more. So number one, the point is, is that they market on price. That's a big mistake. Number two, they don't recognise their expertise and market themselves that way. Mm -hmm. And number three, I've got to say, in this day and age that we live in, they have a woeful or none website. They either have no website mm -hmm. or they have a woeful website. And the very first thing that we all do now when we meet someone in business, we go straight to their website. And if it's awful, you think their business is awful. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, the, particularly the early stages of entrepreneurs starting out in business and uh, navigating the, the, the murky water, so to speak, um, trying to work out what I idea they want to um, chase or um, what area to niche in, um, what tips do you have for trying to find out that one area? Because a lot of business experts stress the importance of focusing on one thing rather than you know, spreading themselves too thin. Mm -hmm. I think there's an argument for both, mm -hmm. uh, focusing on one thing and doing that right. In fact. I can remember my parents used to say that to me. I was a bit of a scatterbrain. They go, well, just focus on one thing, please. <laughs> I think my wife said that a few times, too. Um, but when you're bitten with the entrepreneurial um, bug, then you do tend to have a few balls in the air. Yeah. Um, I think there's an argument for both, and that is focusing on one thing and doing that properly. But there's also the other argument for testing and fixing. And um, I am a typical entrepreneur. I have uh, lots of projects going on. Uh, one minute I can be talking to the butcher, and the next minute I can be talking to a cake decorating company. That only came up because I had a meeting with one <laughs> two okay. days ago. Um, next minute I can be dealing with Jerry Seinfeld doing mm -hmm. a campaign. So a yeah. typical entrepreneur, I've got all these balls in the air and I'm not the norm. I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? I, as I got older, I decided that if I was going to have some balls in the air, make sure that they're the right ones. They're the ones that have got a good chance of working. Not just one that somebody knocked on your door and said, hey, I've got, I'm writing a book, would you like to be involved in it? Mm. So what I do now is I test and measure. So, um, and I test cheaply. Because the thing is, is if you are an entrepreneurial spirit and you do want to do two or three or four things, mm -hmm. then make sure that you can test them relatively cost effectively so the ones that don't work are not going to cost you a lot of money. And that's what I do. I have a lot of people coming to me these days with business ideas because of what I do. Um, I guess you know, part of the marketing of me is using a term, the business whisperer. And I know that sounds very boastful and sounds like I'm showing off, but I can pretty much tell within about 20 minutes whether that business has got a chance of working. And yeah. say because I'm an older person these days and, you know, maybe I've been through the ropes a lot of businesses, but I can pretty much promote myself as a business whisperer and put my hand mm -hmm. on my heart. No, that's the truth. I can walk into a cafe and say, you know what? You're a cafe, you're selling coffee, and you're selling 
uh, relaxation and yet all your colours are blue and green. You mm. aren't a seafood restaurant. Yeah. You know, Gloria Jeans got it right. Now I'm not particularly a fan of their coffee, but their ambience, they got it right. You know, if yeah. I walked into a Gloria Jeans and it was not a Gloria Jeans, it was an ordinary coffee shop, I'd go browns and tans and deep oranges and beautiful lounge suites and oh, the smell of that, co you got it right. Mm. Um, and so therefore, I really think that you can go down two paths. Yes, concentrate on something, that's fine. But at the same time, if you do have two or three ideas, mm -hmm. just test and fix. And so you mentioned um, you've worked with Jerry Seinfeld um, with one of your um, very high profile clients, um, Greater Building Society. Uh, what do you think was particularly key um, to, to that campaign success? Okie dokie. Um, let me tell you how it came about to start with. Um, the general manager of that building society had uh, a meeting with me and he said, look, um, the campaigns that I had been developing for them over a number of years had worked very, very well. And one of those campaigns was a classic wow factor, um, or the greater building society certainly was. Uh, I don't do the marketing anymore. I'm not involved with them in the last couple of years because I'm uh, set up the Institute of Wow. But when I was looking after their marketing, I was there for a good 10 or 11 years. And in the early part of my involvement with them, I asked them what was their um, acquisition scheme for home loans. And they, this is a great case study, by the way. They said, oh, uh, around the table, there was half a dozen senior executives, and they said, well, we have a 1% honeymoon rate. And I said, but every other bank has got a 1% honeymoon rate. Mm. And they went, right. And I said, well, why are you doing that when you're only a relatively small player compared to the Commonwealth Bank and all the big guys? You're not going to stand out if you're doing a 1% and they're doing a 1%, but they've got more money to spend on marketing, you're going to be invisible, which to my mind, they sort of were. So I said to them, listen, how about we do something different? And I came back to them with a proposal, and that was that uh, I had a travel wholesaler that I was doing some work for. And this travel wholesaler could provide to them a $2,000 holiday for $1,000, or $2,000, sorry, or a $4,000 holiday for $2,000. So I said to them, listen, that 1% honeymoon rate that you have, which costs you $1,000 on the, on the $100,000 loan for the first year, how about you give that to the travel wholesaler, and he'll give you a $2,000 holiday for the $1,000. So in other words, to swap across from a 1% honeymoon rate to a campaign which said get a holiday, uh, sorry, get a home loan and get a free holiday was cost neutral, mm -hmm. never cost them any more money. And that's what we did. They said, oh, well, smart Alec, uh, we'll try this for three months and see whether or not your entrepreneurial spirits know what you're talking about. They tried it and we came on TV and said, get a home loan anywhere else and you get a home loan. Get a home loan from the Greater Building Society and you'll get a free holiday. They tripled their home loans in the first year, went nuts. And so therefore, it stayed for a good nine or 10 years. It was the longest sales promotion, I think, ever. And towards the latter part of that, uh, a few years ago, the general manager said to me, you know what, that's been so spectacularly successful. We think we've probably got all the low-lying fruit. What we'd like to do is to take our brand up, because a building society and credit union are generally working class audience, that's their target audience. And I said, oh, okay, well, what would you like to get to? And he said, oh, white collar, senior management. I said, you've mistaken me for David Copperfield. <laughs> I can't do that. A building society will never attract the high-end lawyer and doctor. It just won't. But I said, we could get middle management level. Mm -hmm. And cut a long story short, I put together for them a celebrity-led campaign. They liked the idea. We put a lot of research out to determine which celebrities would be cheeky and a little bit irreverent, like mm -hmm. the greater was. And um, just my luck, guess who topped the list? Jerry Seinfeld and Robin Williams and Jim Carrey, all of those yeah. sorts of characters. You know, Bert Newton and Rove came way down number 100. Mm -hmm. And so I dug a hole for myself because once I'd come up with this idea, I've got to deliver. Yeah. So we chased down um, Jerry Seinfeld mm -hmm. and for nine months and we never got any reply to anything because mm -hmm. he's harder to get to than the Pope. And eventually mm -hmm. persistence paid off. Mm -hmm. We got him to do it. And um, Jerry was absolutely perfect. In the first two years of that campaign, the greater tripled its home loan market share in Australia, which is just ridiculous. Oh, that's really incredible. Yeah. It's amazing how, um, like you said, the persistence, um, making sure that you stay on that and eventually you know, the rewards can follow. Well, it is. And <clears throat> part of my story is that back in the uh, early 90s, unfortunately, uh, someone who was working for me made a big mistake. Mm. I was doing all of the um, uh, scratch bingo games and a lot of the fast food promotions at the time. And uh, this particular person made a mistake when I was away overseas uh, one week and I lost uh, $2.2 $2 2 million in a week. And uh, the bank came in to close up my business. We had 20-odd staff at the time. And I said to the bank, look, I'm pitching for 
the rugby league card bubblegum license and I should you know, know whether I get that in the next month or two. And the bank said, well, um, you've got a month. And if you don't get that, then we know there's no future for you because you've just lost all this money. Mm. And um, we'll give you a month. And you wouldn't believe it um, as, I won't say luck goes, I had a few words to go upstairs. Um, on the eve of the bank closing our business, the day before, because I had bugged the rugby league guy who was making the decision on this. There was five companies pitching for the license, by the way. Okay. Every day I was ringing him, yeah. ringing him, persistence, <laughs> ringing him, ringing him, ringing him. And on the day before the bank was going to close us up, so it was the end of my career at that stage, and this was back, as I said, in the mid-90s, um, I got a call from the rugby league guy, who's now a dear friend, but I didn't know him at the time. And he said, I've got some news for you. Well, because my hand was shaking. You know, it was either Caravan Park. <laughs> like all the rugby league cards would help me make a comeback. And I knew if I got the rugby league licence, I could promote them differently from the bubblegum cards and probably make a good comeback. And he's on the phone, he said, I've got some news for you. And I said, what's that? He said, I've made my decision. I went, yes. And he goes, you've got the licence. And I went, oh my goodness. <laughs> and I said, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, not that he knew the position I was in. And he said, but on one condition. And I said, yeah, sure, anything, anything, what's that? He goes, you never ring me again for the rest of your <laughs> life. <laughs> and we're great mates now, yeah. but you know what he said to me, the reason that I got the license and the other four companies didn't was because of my persistence. And on the bottom of one of those little motivational calendars one day, I read, persistence beats intelligence. Mm. And it does. Wonderful. You've worked with a number of very high profile clients, including Caltex, KFC, McDonald's. Uh, what do you think are the key differences between marketing for your larger clients versus small businesses, if there are any differences? Um, I don't think there's a lot of differences. Um, obviously, the budget is mm -hmm. different. Um, in terms of my philosophy, though, I don't think there's a lot of difference. Um, I have a, um, a philosophy that I've called the wheel of wow. And uh, that is so corny, even I want to, even though I want to do that. Um, and the reason I've done this is because it's easier for any business owner or manager to get it into their head. Mm -hmm. And the Wheel of Wow, if you can imagine, the Wheel of Wow has five sections. And the first one is research. So it doesn't matter whether you're a big business or a small business, you should do research. Mm -hmm. So when I mentioned to you there before we chose Jerry Seinfeld to be the spokesperson for the Building Society, I'd never watched many Jerry Seinfeld shows. It didn't have anything to do with whether I liked him or not. It had everything to do with the research. We asked the customers and non-customers who they thought would be a good spokesperson for the Building Society. His name came to the top. So number one, research. And you know what? Most small, well, practically all small businesses and most big businesses, would you believe, do no research. Mm -hmm. They just make stuff up. Number two of that wheel of wow is um, create a wow factor to take their eyes off the price. Mm -hmm. And I've explained that to you before. Number three is to develop a problem solution mentality. In other words, give someone their problem and then provide them with the solution. So the guys that are good at that are the infomercials on TV. You know, whether it's the weight loss program and they'll show someone who's overweight but they go onto the dietary program and then four weeks later they look like Miranda Kerr. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's either them or maybe, you know, the app swing people, they do that very well. But a lot of businesses think, oh, that's for corny information. No, the problem solution scenario is for every business. Mm -hmm. And Panadol and Nurofen now have woken up to that fact. They don't tell you anymore what's in the tablet. They used mm -hmm. to tell you that there was, there was, there was a paracetamol and codeine. Yeah. No, now they just say, have you got a headache? In 15 minutes, take one of these, it's gone. Mm -hmm. We only want to know the solution. We want the benefits, not the features. So problem okay. solution. The fourth thing is have a good website, have a compelling website. Mm -hmm. And I've got lots of components that you must have in your website for it to be a selling website, not an information website. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, the fifth thing is repetitive trade. You don't want to make one sale. You've got to build a technique into your sales program that makes them come back and back and back. And the best example of that, which is a very simple one for a small business, is the coffee shop. You know how you get, every time you get a coffee, you get the card and they clip nine holes and then mm -hmm. you get 10th coffee yeah. free. No one else does that. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, if you said to me, okay, well, what's the difference between marketing a small business and a large one? Hardly anything uh, except the budget, because I think even a big business, whilst they do tend to waste a lot of money on football team sponsorships and putting ads on the back of buses and taxis and things like that, mm -hmm. they really should come back to those five components of my wheel of wow. In terms of the, um, the wow factor and trying to be incredibly um, unique, um, can you tell us a bit about how you've actually incorporated that into um, some of the books that you've written? Um, <laughs> the books? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, look, uh, I, I've got to be careful not to be a hypocrite because uh, when you are a, an advisor or a consultant, 
Sometimes you fall into that trap where it's like the painter who lives in a house that's not painted. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I can remember back in my early days, um, I was, had a partner in business uh, at the time and the phone wasn't ringing. And we were an advertising marketing consultancy at the time. It wasn't, it was some years ago. And his name was Peter. And over a coffee, I said to Peter, the phone's not ringing. And he said, no. And I said, I wonder why. And then we looked at each other and burst out laughing. We hadn't marketed ourselves. <laughs> we hadn't advertised. So we were hypocrites. And uh, I often say that. It's just amazing. The car mechanic drives around in a bomb. So I thought, if I'm going to write a book, I better make sure that that book is Mr. Wow. Okay? It, mm -hmm. it actually personifies what I, what I preach. Yes. So I've got exhibit A here, by the way. I thought you might ask this question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the size of the book. It's the size of a tabloid newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I decided that if I was going to write a book, then it had to be special. Now, my brief, uh, what's in this book? Um, not only my 10-point um, uh, manifesto, in other words, how to promote your business, how to market, how to get new sales. I've called it the 10-point client attraction formula. And five of those points I've just mentioned to you in the Wheel of Wow with mm -hmm. another five in this book. Now the thing is, is that uh, when I was putting this book together to make sure that it looked and felt as prestigious as it does, and by the way, if you don't mind, I'll just open a few pages. Yeah. This is about 25 years of all of my best ideas. The bad ideas didn't make it in here, okay? Mm -hmm. So therefore, basically I say to anyone, can you imagine having that as a resource sitting on the corner of your desk? Whenever you're looking for a sales stimulant, then you can go to this book and just go to any of the chapters in it. But what I decided to do with this is that if it was going to look as prestigious as I believe it needed to, I had to brief my artist on what it would look like. Mm -hmm. And this is a tip for any small business too. And that is, is that when I went to my artist, I said to him, you know what? This is Walt Disney meets Steven Spielberg at mm -hmm. the Palazzo Versace. And hence, you end up with you know, a book that looks pretty upmarket. Yes. And just as he was about to start the artwork, I said to him, oh, by the way, they also invited Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, if I was going to uh, practice what I preach, then I needed to make sure that that's in pretty much everything I do. So that book is a little bit different from most others you'd see in a bookshop. Yeah, no, that's very impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Some brands stick, whereas other brands come and go as passing fads. Why do you think this is? Uh, I, think there's, I think there's a bunch of reasons, but I think the main one is um, integrity. Um, I think that uh, our radar, uh, when I say us, I mean the consumers, radar, mm -hmm. is really up these days for things that um, don't have integrity or things that promise more than what they deliver. Mm -hmm. I think we're very sceptical and you, know, you can thank the social media for that, of course. You know. Um, and so therefore I think the brands that stick are the ones that do what they say that they're going to do. And also the brands that stick are the ones that are marketing savvy um, and they understand the power of creating a community. Um, you see the reason that some of the football teams, and I'm, I speak rugby league in particular, are still running around and operational and yet they make no uh, sense to be even alive from a commercial vi viability point of view because there's a few of the football clubs out there that are just about broke is because they've created guess what a tribe they've mm -hmm. created a tribe and that tribe will follow them where and, and therefore if the head office of the rugby league tried to get rid of that team you can imagine there'd be an uproar and in mm -hmm. fact that happened some years ago with South Sydney and, and you know some other teams that were put out of the competition all hell broke loose and the brands that have stickiness are the ones that create a tribe. Mm -hmm. And the best way to create a tribe, of course, is to gain data from your consumers from the outset. Mm -hmm. And the thing that freaks me out, keeps me awake at night, well, it doesn't really keep me awake at night, but let's <laughs> say that, okay? Um, I can't believe it. There's so many people don't collect the details of their tribe. Mm. If I asked you, when was the last time you went into a restaurant and they asked for your personal details before you left? I bet you couldn't tell yeah, me. Yeah, really, if ever. The amount of money they're leaving on the table. You can go to Movie World or Dream World or Sea World on the Gold Coast mm -hmm. and never be asked for your name, your email or your mobile. Mm -hmm. They might ask you for your postcode. And you know, Whenever I've taken the teenagers to Movie World, because I live on the Gold Coast, mm -hmm. I've got a bunch of teenagers with me and the girl behind the little ticket booth says, oh, can I get your postcode? And I go, yeah, 4210, but what's that going to do any good? You know. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, well, I've just been asked to get your postcard. I said, well, don't you want my name and my email address and my mobile number? <laughs> and she goes, I have to call security. <laughs> so yeah. I cannot believe it. Uh, the rugby league, 
They'll have 82,000 people at their grand final. They don't know who they are. Mm. The AFL will have 100,000 people at their grand final. They'll know, they don't know who they are. The only people in business that collect data, to me, appear to be Amazon. <laughs> well, Amazon, uh, your hairdresser, because they book you in for another month time. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority, like 98% of businesses, don't collect that. McDonald's don't collect any data. Bunnings don't collect any data. Harvey Norman doesn't collect any data. And I can go on and on. Michelle's Patisserie. You go into Westfield, they won't ask who you are. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, how can you possibly create a tribe when you don't collect any data? Madness. And you know, a business owner might say who's watching this, oh, I collect the data of a customer. Well, that's fine, mm -hmm. but collect the data of prospects and you'll have more customers. Yeah. Um, and when you have that data, communicate to them. Don't belt your database. There are so many people that annoy their database by sending out mm -hmm. emails every second day. And guess what? They're down to single digits open rates mm -hmm. and they wonder why so create the relationship once you've got the, the database but make sure you don't annoy them and speaking of tribes uh, what is the difference between um, a tribe of you know raving fans versus customers okay okay um, okay um, uh, if you only have raving fans um, then you have not done the marketing job that you should have done okay so you need to make sure that you're continually converting a percentage of those raving fans into clients. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where the wow factor mantra comes in. Because um, part of what I preach is that if you do position yourself as the expert, you do what I'm doing here today, okay? Um, you know, I'm not getting paid for this, um, but guess what? I'm giving out lots and lots of free information. Mm -hmm. And you know what that'll do? Um, that will make some people gravitate towards me. That's what happens. And Steve Irwin gave lots and lots of free information out. And guess what we did? We all gravitated towards him. And I often say to people, if you turn on your TV on the weekend at the moment, you will see a lot of wildlife experts. Mm -hmm. They all came out of the woodwork, haven't they? You know what? They were around when Steve Irwin was around, but because he positioned himself as the expert, they were invisible. And that's the point. If you are wanting to create a tribe and then turn that tribe into, or a good portion of them, into customers, mm -hmm. give them lots of value once they join your system. So once they become your tribe member, mm -hmm. don't just leave them there. Make sure that you provide them with lots of free, valuable stuff. Now, in some instances, that might be a free gift. Mm -hmm. In other instances, and most likely in most instances, it will be free advice. And then they will warm even further towards you and at some stage in the you know, cycle, they will buy something. On a bit of a different note, um, talking about fear um, and the uh, more of the emotional hurdles that entrepreneurs face in business and trying to uh, overcome their comfort zone and move past that, uh, what tips do you have for um, you know, pushing that boundary? Try and become an extrovert, okay? Most people, who admit to being frightened are introverts. And uh, I don't have any scientific statistics on that, but this is certainly an observation that I've made, is that people who um, tend to be wary of things and they tend to probably um, go overboard when it comes to research. Don't get me wrong, I'm a great fan of research, mm -hmm. and, uh, but there are some people that get analysis paralysis because they just keep on yeah. researching. It's a bit like the full-time uni student who's still at uni when they're 38. You know? mm -hmm. They just don't want to jump out into that real world. Um, I think that a lot of it is because they're not extroverted. And uh, I know you might say to me, oh, well, you, know, you can, just can't become a show-off like me overnight. You don't turn from being a, you know, uh, hiding in the corner of the library mm -hmm. to jumping out on stage and doing what I do. No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that if you do have some fears and some concerns, start to rub shoulders with people like you and like me, people who are entrepreneurial and aren't frightened to show off. Uh, I show off, but hopefully it's in a, in a, in a comical and lighthearted way. I mean, I make as many mistakes as the next person, right? Mm -hmm. Um, did I just say that? <laughs> did I just say that? Um, but I try and make sure that they know that I'm very good at what I do. But, uh, you know, I, I'm every day too. I'm, I'm, I'm a parent, I've got six kids, I'm hopefully pretty down to earth. And, um, and, but I'm extroverted. Uh, I'm the one that's probably going to glue the phone to the handset so that when someone picks it up, they bash themselves in the air. Um, <laughs> so I'm a bit of a larrikin. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, oh, people have to hang around me, but hang around people who are extroverted, people mm -hmm. who have got a lot of fun in their life, 
Because even though you may be introverted and you might be frightened about some things, if you hang around with enough positive thinking people, you'll make that jump. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, you will make that jump. Yeah, that, that's great advice. Uh, what are some of your um, tips and, uh, I guess, uh, strategies that you apply? They could be like, for example, daily rituals to keep motivated, productive and on track. Yep. Uh, read more of these. Okay, mm -hmm. now, uh, not necessarily this one, but read uh, more books mm -hmm. or watch more documentaries as yeah. this is sort of a doco the way that you're mm -hmm. doing it. Um, learn from the experts. Um, and, you know, if you said to me, well, who were, in other words, get mentors, get mentors. Now, I know you might say, look, that's not a daily ritual. That's mm -hmm. just a philosophy throughout life. And, you know, my view is um, you will get you know, the likes of Simon Reynolds, a terrific entrepreneur here in Australia, yeah. and, um, and your Anthony Robbins and so forth, they will say, look, you know, you must read um, three books a month or five books a month. And look, I'm not as disciplined as that because um, my life, when you have six kids, um, <laughs> there's some months never am I going to get to read a book, let alone six. But my response to that question would be, if you are going to move forward, then um, I guess acknowledge that success leaves clues and therefore study the success of people uh, who of course have made it mm -hmm. and you will find that a certain amount of that will rub off on you but you just can't you just can't read Seth Godin's Purple Cow and go that's it I know what to do now <laughs> you've got to read and study successful people ongoing and I don't read so many magazines and I don't read so many novels. I read a bunch of autobiographies for that reason. Mm. And if you said to me, well, who were the people that would inspire me? I would say, like everybody would say, of course, if they're an entrepreneur, they'll say Richard Branson these days, but Walt Disney, uh, Steven Spielberg, people who were creative, but were very businesslike as well. They're the mm. people that certainly excite me. Jim Rohn talks about um, success being easy, but also so is neglect. How important is self-discipline? Um, very important because I'm a good example of someone who didn't have that for a long while. <laughs> uh, my wife is the daughter of an accountant, okay, so therefore she's left brain and she's married this twit who's right brain. Uh, and so therefore maybe it was the case of opposites attract, I'm not sure. Um, but every time I would have a whole bunch of um, projects, you know, in the air, mm -hmm. she would be the disciplined one who would say to me, can you please just do one thing at one time? Um, her main uh, rationale for that is that I think she wanted to put food on the table for the six kids or something, something <laughs> like that. Uh, and she was frightened that if I was distracted, you know, undisciplined wise, if I was distracted yeah. on too many projects that not one of them would come off. Now, fortunately for us, I mean, we had, we've had a roller coaster ride um, throughout my younger years, but fortunately, as we got a bit older, I became, guess what? more discipline. Mm -hmm. So whereas before uh, I might have 10 or 15 projects in the air when really if you looked at them you knew that 10 would just be silly things. I don't know why I got involved in them, I just couldn't say no. Now what I do is that I put everything through a, um, uh, I guess a formula and if it meets that formula then I will follow that project or I will get into partnership with someone in that project and I become a hell of a lot more disciplined. And um, if you have a bunch of younger people watching this program, which I suspect you do, who are in their 20s or 30s, then um, I would definitely give them the tip, and that is, is that be disciplined to the extent that even if you have multiple balls in the air, make sure that they meet the criteria of um, having a return on investment relatively quickly. I find that uh, when I was young and perhaps more starry-eyed, I was getting involved in things that could not have possibly had a return for another five or ten years. That would have been some lean years of, you know, having fish and chips, wouldn't it? Yeah. So now what I do is that if I, you know, if the young person has millions of dollars behind them, fine, take five years for the thing to get up. But one of the things that I do now to discipline myself, I go, you know what, if I got involved in that, would it be up within three months, six months or a year? Mm -hmm. And if it's not, I tend to back away from it. Sure. What are your top three tips for entrepreneurs seeking business success? Top three, top three. Um, Probably, yeah, probably number one would be adopt a message to market match mentality. And by that I mean um, there are so many business owners and managers, this is both small and big, who I just shake my head when I see their advertising, I just shake my head and think that is the wrong message um, to the wrong market. And um, I'll give you an example. I, um, uh, when I got involved with the Greater Building Society, which is the Jerry Seinfeld um, Financial Institution, um, 
the advertising agency that looked after that account before I came along mm -hmm. had a copywriter who was probably, I don't know, somewhere between 25 and 35. And that copywriter was doing all of the copy for all of their brochures. So it wouldn't matter whether it was a home loan or an investment product or savings account. And I looked at the brochures when I came in because I had to do a time and motion study for the business to start with. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, the language that this guy was using was not language that, um, for example, they had a pensioner account. So for people who were over 65, the language that he was using in that brochure was great for Gen Y or Gen X, yeah. but to a person who was in their 70s, wicked sick meant something completely different <laughs> right? to someone yes. who was in their 20s. And I'm not saying he used that, I'm mm. joking, but the thing yeah. was is that you could see the tone and the demeanour of mm. the copy that he was writing was not a message to market match. Um, I guess another example of that is Jenny Craig came out and spoke to a whole bunch of skinny people, mm -hmm. then I don't think she'd make too many sales. Yeah. She'd have the same sales pitch about weight loss programs, but skinny people aren't going to buy into that. So I think it's very, very important before you do anything to make sure that you've got the right message to the right market. Mm -hmm. oh, let me t I've got to tell you how stupid I was in my early days. I was working at Roselands and uh, the Eadles record store said to me they had a pop star coming out. And I said, oh, who is it? And uh, you'd be too young to know who this was, but his name was Leif Garrett. And Leif Garrett was the Justin Bieber at the time. Okay. But this twit had no idea. I just, yeah, okay, we'll put him on at the shopping centre on Thursday night. Guess what? Every girl's high school for yeah. 10, mile, 10, well, 10 miles, 10 miles, I'm showing my age, 10 kilometres, all left school that day and came into Roselands Shopping Centre. We had 15,000 screaming schoolgirls in the shopping centre. The police would not even let him on the stage because it was Beatlemania all over mm -hmm. again. So he only just waved from a balcony and they took him off again. Mm -hmm. um, guess what? Um, we had to back in seven ambulances into the shopping centre to pick up all the girls who had fainted and broken arms and legs. It was just hysteria. <laughs> now that was me completely missing the message mm -hmm. to market match. They sold a lot of bubble gum that day, but all the shops closed their doors. Mm -hmm. So I learned from that. Um, no, I didn't. I think I did something stupid like that two or three times more. But um, <laughs> the thing is, I learned, of course, the right message to the right market. So that's number one. Number two, I'm guessing that most of the people watching this video are challenger brands. Mm -hmm. And a challenger brand is one, uh, as it says, who doesn't have a high market share and they need to do things differently to stand out. Now, Richard Branson with his Virgin Airlines here in Australia was a challenger brand. Many would say now that he's not because he's challenged Qantas to keep the airfare and all those sorts of things that he did. Mm -hmm. And they'd probably say he's a leading brand now, but he was a spectacular success of a challenger brand rising very quickly to the top. If you are a challenger brand, then you need to do things differently. Why? Because you don't have the budget. You don't have the marketing budget of the big boys. So the Greater Building Society, um, it's a challenger brand. So when I said, look, get a home loan through the Greater and get a free holiday, do you think any of the big leading brands like the Commonwealth Bank or the ANZ ever did it or even remotely thought about doing something like that? No, they're big, fat and lazy. And they've got a market share that we can only dream of so they don't need to work as hard. Whereas if you're a challenger brand, you've got to challenge and do things differently. So if you are a business owner at the moment uh, or manager, identify whether or not you're a challenger brand, and I suspect most people watching this are, okay. and make sure then that you use my, well, my mantra, the wow factor mantra, to look different from your big boys because you will never match them in budget, mm -hmm. but you can kill them. You can easily beat them in terms of your strategy if you use the wow factor or what Seth Godin says, the purple cow philosophy. And last but not least, without wanting to be too philosophical, um, never, ever, 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 ever give up. Okay? And uh, I have borrowed that phrase from Sir Winston Churchill because in 1949, I think it was, or somewhere in the 1940s, as Prime Minister of England, he went back to the school that he went to as a child and he gave a speech. And he said to the kids, look, I've become Prime Minister and I know that you might, might all think that I've achieved, you know, uh, the impossible. And maybe I have, but he said, if you ask me um, to give you or leave you with anything today, can I just leave you with this uh, piece of advice? And that is never, ever, 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 ever give up. He used the word ever like a lot of times. And I must say that I think I'm probably an example of that. Um, I tend to be a bit persistent. And as I said before, persistence tends to beat intelligence. So if you're in business and things are looking a bit rocky at the moment, and they, they will for all of us, then hang in there. Just never, ever give up.
Well, thank you so much, John, for um, sharing your insights with us. Um, your background is incredibly inspiring. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. My pleasure.